history of medicine in Louisiana is a gumbo. Coming together many ingredients from many different sources into a marvelous food for the body and the soul. As with all good gumbos, you must start with a root. So we will start with a medical root, and it will take an, a hot iron skillet of human will and spirit, as well as tenacity over years of trials and tribulation, pain and suffering and death, and a lot of stirring with God's help. The culture of Louisiana has been drawn from three greatest colonizing nations of Europe, Great Britain, France, and Spain. No other state has drawn so heavily from all three. Louisiana once encompassed a vast domain extending from the Appalachian Mountains on the east to the Rocky Mountains on the west, from the Gulf of Mexico, and north to the Great Lakes, and Canada to the, to the north. In 1803, Louisiana, within 20 days, came successfully, uh, su successfully, successively under the sovereignty of Spain, France, and the United States. G. W. McGinney, in his a History of Louisiana in 1949, relates the story of a Dr. Thompson, a assumed physician, residing across the state line in Texas about the middle of the 19th century, who had been a subject of two monarchies, Spain and France, a citizen of two republics, Texas and the United States, a resident of three parishes, Natchitoches, Caddo, and DeSoto, without moving his house or his practice. Such was the interesting time in Southern history. So I will take you back in time, and with the help of historians far better than I, try to relate our history and medical path over the years. So there are at least seven cultures that impacted Louisiana, uh, starting from 1500 BC. They were here in Louisiana. And the ones that we know more about are these last four uh, and uh, notably, I will discuss the, uh, the very last one, which is the Caddo culture. These last four sort of overlapped each other. In other words, there were natives from all these four cultures sort of existing at the same time, some disappearing, others folding, and others advancing. But physical uh, anthropological data of skeletal remains showed that these people suffered from cleft palates, osteoarthritis, pyrrhea, dental abscesses, caries, and notably syphilis. Okay, if you remember the date now. But uh, there were uh, skeletons uh, from burial sites. And they also practiced cranial deformity. And this was where, it, where the child was born. It was usually for, uh, for uh, uh, the most important families within the tribe or that would uh, a child would be have the head of the infant bound on a cradle board until the head became permanently flattened either in the front or in the occipital area and you can see this object uh, just to the bottom right that shows uh, the deformity of the head and this goes back to some of the cultures that were in Mexico and Central America but uh, and they were usually kept in these uh, framing uh, devices until they were about 10 years old, and it usually indicated the highest status uh, within that tribe. Next. Uh, the Cataculture burial site, the Belcher site, which I showed you, which is right, at, right up in the Shreveport area, uh, they were able to come across the fact that bony changes of syphilis, and there were also arm fractures, leg fractures among adolescents. Uh, they also had osteoarthritis, osteosarcomas. Uh, we talked about the dental problems they had. They all suffered from that extensive disease. The female adults outnumbered the male adults in the burial sites. Half of the adult males died between the ages of 20 and 30, and the females were from 20 years to more advanced age. But I think notable was the fact that there were the, the osteoperiotitis of syphilis found. By the third decade of the 18th century, the Chattamachas were gone. The Chihuahua were deliberately killed by black slaves on the order of one of the governors uh, in New Orleans. 
in the Natchez mounted an all-out war against the French to save their sacred Grand Village, which was near Nat well near uh, Natchez. And anyway, the French went there and beat them and uh, transported the ones they didn't kill. They transported to New Orleans and they sold them into slavery and then even sent them into the West Indies because they wanted to get them out of the state. And so they just they just did away with the rest of them. This is a very early uh, painting that was done by a uh, drawing by Debay, but it shows uh, uh, medicine doctors at work, both men and women. And it's interesting, here you, you see a medicine man uh, sucking a cut, uh, he spat the blood in a bowl, and then the mothers drank milk, uh, drank the blood because they thought it purified their milk. Uh, it shows a patient getting his head fumigated with the fire of herbs to induce vomiting. We know that yopon was used, and that of course is a plant that we have in our flower beds now and around our houses because it grows so well, both native and uh, domestic varieties. But in comparison to European medicine of its day, Indian medicine really didn't fare too bad, badly comparing both because both relied on bleeding, fasting, purging, and vomiting. The natives could also handle simple fractures and dislocations, in some cases better than the, uh, the European doctors. They numbered in thousands, shared medicines, lived in a sacred world, respected all things, living and not. They believed spirits were everywhere. Uh, they believed in sweating, because that helped flush the body of evil things. And fasting also helped that, particularly if it was done in holy places, like in their temples and on their mounds and in their huts. They believed in uh, purging people, which is what the, the European doctors did, and sucking wounds and poisonous bites and bleeding, letting blood uh, from the patient, and then using biotechnical bio remedies to a large extent, both herbal and plant materials. So with the coming of Europeans, uh, they were confronted with the fact that the natives believed in human sacrifice, they believed in uh, sacrificing their infants, in suicide, they had no problem, if life wasn't good, they knew they'd come back, and uh, they believed in an afterlife and a chance to come back, and they had. And they even, uh, particularly the Atakapaw, uh, ate uh, whenever they uh, beat another tribe. They, we don't know exactly what sex parts they did. They didn't eat the entire body, but there were some things that they did eat as part of the belief of uh, getting the strength of that particular warrior. And they had medicine men, as we discussed, much like the Egyptians. They could not separate medicine from magic. It was all tied. They had no weapons to deal with the, we the diseases that came from Europe because natives had no natural immunity. And particularly, whole tribes were wiped out by smallpox. Even into the late 18th century, the U.S. government gave blankets infected with smallpox to native tribes in Alaska to wipe them out. Contributions that uh, was made to medicine by uh, Native Americans. There are those who agree and those who disagree about this, but at least 59 drugs have been added to the mo modern pharmacopoeia, which came from these uh, native uh, herbs and plants. They were particularly big on sweet gum resin, uh, which uh, we have trees all around us of, of that variety, if you recognize those particular seed balls that come from them. Uh, they also, of course, were responsible for gumbo filet and, uh, and various herbals. Again, their, their superstitions and magic were strong in their beliefs. And, and some of these things still exist even today in certain uh, parts of the state and cultures. And it was very popular during the early days because it was all what the colonists and the settlers first had, sometimes as their first or second medication as a treatment option. And of course, with it came hope. I think it's interesting that, uh, that there were almost two separate types of uh, medicine men that were brought from the native uh, belief. Witchcraft was dreaded, and it persisted long after the naval, uh, tribal religion began shifting to Christianity. 
The colonial Europeans feared witches as much as the Indians did. And the Louisiana Indians saw witchcraft and medicine as being very closely related, which was a great power for good, but it could be easily turned into a great power for evil. Uh, some tribes, like the Chickasaw, separated the herbal from the ritual medicines, so they had two different types, both. And the herbalists were usually older men and women who offered plant remedies and occupied a position much like a pharmacist does and, and was far from simple. And it was the homeless Indians that really sort of came up with the, uh, the title of the traiteur. And of course the Acadians came and that became part of their uh, medical belief and care. So many came to Louisiana. Uh, Spanish came first, and with them they brought a few slaves, and we know that some of these were left behind or they escaped. Uh, French came and stayed, then more Africans were brought in, then Spanish returned, and then other ethnic groups, and then the Americans. But colonists were totally dependent upon the government for protection, for food, and for medicine. Iberville, the father of Louisiana, was actually a French-Canadian. Uh, he was a naval hero and was chosen by the king to colonize the territory. And he had engaged one of the first surgeons to come to Louisiana, and that was in uh, 1698, and we know he was paid uh, 30 lira a month. But he's the first known surgeon to actually be in place to take care primarily of the French soldiers. But again, he also was available to the few settlers or builders that came with him. Uh, the health care of the colony in 17, I think, uh, fascinating story. Uh, they had to send what health care they sent over. But there was a, uh, a midwife who was sent from France. And, and these most of these... Uh, Midwives were very well trained uh, in what they did. And when she arrived, uh, Bienville said that he considered her a nurse. And she was not a nurse. She didn't consider herself a nurse. She was a midwife. And she refused to serve as a nurse. And her reason was, was that she felt that if she took care of soldiers who had various diseases, particularly scurvy, that they seemed to have that she was afraid that she was going to take these illnesses to her mothers and to their offspring. So she actually was talking about a germ theory that was not known to exist at the time. And she refused to do it, and he didn't pay her. It wasn't until another governor came and took over that he was sympathetic to her. We still don't know if she was ever paid what she was promised when she left France to come to the colony. And in 1713, they actually rented a house that was to serve as a hospital because you had to take care of the soldiers. Soldiers were important to the defense. And again, if they got sick and they relied on themselves to take care of themselves, then instead of having uh, one soldier off duty, you sometimes had three because two were staying behind to take care of their friend. So it made sense to have some means of taking care of the sick soldier so the rest of the soldiers could continue doing what they were supposed to do in protecting the colony. And so beginning in 1717, there was a flood of newcomers. And again, many soldiers came, but they were all sick and required care. You had the founding of New Orleans, which brought many new settlers to that area and two new surgeons. Uh, James Bartlett writing a translation in English from the French in 1682 described the difficulty facing ship surgeons who tried to administer proper remedies to the morbid Negroes in the hold. They cannot go leisurely between de decks because of the great heat, and there, which is continually, which is sometimes so excessive the surgeons would faint away and candles would not burn. The Irish came from 1846 to 1856. A third of all immigrants, immigrants came from Ireland. It was during their potato famine, and, and they had to get out. And so by 1860, there were about 25,000 living in New Orleans. Now, these people came. Uh, most of them were farmers. And again, they did not have their land was already taken up by the Acadians and the Germans. 
So most of them had to work by hand, and they did all the dirty work. Slaves were of such value and uh, importance to the plantations, uh, very often the plantation owners would hire Irish to do the real hard dirty work, the one that exposed them to disease and might cost them their health. This was turned over to the Irish, and many of them died because they were digging canals in New Orleans and on ditches on plantations, which were important for draining sugarcane. Sugarcane had to be well drained for it to grow. Clearing swamp and making new land for farming, that was all done by Irishmen. Very dangerous work, and uh, they had no resistance to disease when they came, and many died. Of course, the survivors uh, acclimated and also prospered when they could go into other forms of work. It was mostly the Irish who actually were in control of the Irish. <laughs> so some did well and others didn't. As mentioned, uh, Claiborne uh, was appointed in 1803 and also at the same time, uh, a Dr. William Botch was sent by the president to New Orleans to attend the U.S. sailors who were on duty. The governor appointed a board of health in 1804, and then by 1808, he ordered the licensing of medical practitioners and pharmacists, and that was really the first time that it happened. Uh, there was a need to establish a Protestant cemetery because all the others were for Catholics only. Uh, there were various epidemics that temporarily stirred up cleanup campaigns, but it was never consistent. And New Orleans did not smell good, particularly during the summer. And the city was overrun by adventures and vagabonds. I mean, it was everybody who came there for a quick buck, and this is where uh, work was. And of course, they had all these goods and produce coming into this area and going out again. So New Orleans, through the 1800s, uh, residents just threw their sewage, trash, and dead animals and waste into the streets and onto the Batcher, which is near the levees and uh, what existed in, in the river. So you had dirty, foul, stagnant water in the gutters of the street, and that was a way of life. So, of course, the smells of the street were offensive to everyone, and so it's no wonder that the homes were built so they had beautiful gardens behind them to sort of get away from the filth on the outside. And from May 1809 to 1810, out of the 2,300, uh, 2,036 soldiers, 686 died. There were desertions, some discharges, and at least a third to half were lost to, mil to uh, malaria, dysentery, and scurvy. The failure of military sur surgeons to diagnose and treat properly was notable. And then I think it's of interest that uh, even the surgeon who you attend to want to uh, trust and believe, uh, his descriptions were quite good. But he, he believed in, um, and he was one of the most able surgeons of his day at that particular time and in that particular place. And he said, one of the, my most usual prescriptions for people who had chronic diarrhea, that meant they were constantly, couldn't stay on duty because they had to go and relieve their bowels. He believed that the application of blisters to the leg just above the ankle was of great use. He said, it was one of my most usual prescriptions and a very good test in doubtful cases whether a man was really sick. Rather than submit to the pain of blistering a second time unless disease, he would prefer to go on duty. So it, they would be threatening with blistering above their ankles to see if they were really uh, 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 making up their, their uh, complaints. And then in 1814, an pneumonia was seen among the surgeons, and he thought it was somehow related to uh, the scurvy, but actually it was influenza uh, that attacked the uh, soldiers. And then in 1811, uh, yellow fever was also present. Again, uh, influenza was present, and from the descriptions that he was even felt to be brought from Europe to the native Indians. And uh, particularly the native Indians suffered, as well as slaves on plantations, sailors and soldiers. The Battle of New Orleans that came in 1815, uh, it uh, 
was of interest mainly because of its impact upon the British, but the U.S. Army regulars who were here were less than a thousand because so many of them had died. Uh, they were deficient in both personnel and care. We just told you about all that they suffered and went through being here. So then Tennessee and Kentucky sent riflemen down from uh, New Orleans following uh, uh, General Jackson because he was from uh, Kentucky, Tennessee. Uh, there were Louisiana uh, militia, volunteers, and even Jean Lafitte, pirates, outlaws, Indians, and other locals made up the American force. And of interest during this battle, their losses were just negligible. The British sent 10,000 veterans of Wellington's campaign. These were men who fought Napoleon and his army, and so they were the top of their game that came. But they arrived in December, landing south of New Orleans and immediately developed fevers and dysentery, which weakened just about everybody in that army. And then it wasn't until January that they decided to make their attack uh, south of New Orleans. And the impact of uh, the American uh, bullets and their weapons on these men, uh, and even though they had surgeons with them, there were, to there were so many wounded that they just uh, they re required help of local physicians to take care of them. Next slide. So they sent uh, riders into the city of New Orleans asking them to, uh, asking for doctors to come south of the city to help take care of the sick. And again, um, there was 3,326 dead and wounded, of which number eventually 859 died. 1,200 were permanently disabled, and at least 1,200 were able to return to duty at some point. But their surgeons at the time were overwhelmed. An uh, English officer after the battle wrote, quote, I cannot describe the strange and ghastly feeling created by seeing a basket full of legs seared from these fine fellows, most of which were still covered with their hose. Next slide. This actually is not easily clear, but this is actually a document signed by the governor of Kentucky uh, giving a warrant to a physician, a surgeon, to follow his men, uh, the riflemen, down to New Orleans and uh, who traveled with them for the Battle of New Orleans. Next slide. Uh, this shows the hospital as it existed in Louisiana at the time of the battle and it was what was called the Royal Hospital or the Military Hospital in Barracks. I guess some of the Soldiers may have been moved into this, though a lot of them went into homes uh, or were cared for in place there in Chalmette. Next slide. Something about the very early hospitals. Uh, when the French settled Louisiana in 1699 and New Orleans was founded in 1718, the Royal Hospital was built in 1726, and that was the first one that was actually as a hospital. You remember there was a house that had been uh, rented uh, before that time to serve as a hospital, but the Royal Hospital was built, but it was only for surgeons, for soldiers, and not always for the settlers, though some were uh, admitted by their doctors, but most of it was for soldiers. And uh, the Company of the Indies, which was by Crozat, he had sent some surgeons, apothecaries, midwives, and medical supplies and invited the Ursuline sisters of Rome, from Rome, to actually come to uh, to the company, uh, the, the colony, to uh, help uh, educate and care for the, the people there. So this shows Charity Hospital in 1815, and it was on the upper side of Canal Street in the square bounded by Barone and University Place. It was one of the first large structures built in the American part of the city. There was a big, great debate among medical uh, types as to who had the first uh, charity hospital in this country. And of course, uh, I think everyone feels that the charity hospital in Louisiana was the first, but uh, there were others that were in existence very close uh, at that time, both in Charleston and up in uh, the Northeast but we still claim it to be the oldest in the country. Next one. 
uh, to sort of understand uh, what uh, physicians and other healers believe was the cause of diseases and, it, and, and to better explain it in their minds and to what they were taught that it had to be an imbalance of at least four, four elements in the body, be it uh, uh, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. And those were all the secretions of the body. And it could be hot, cold, damp, dry, earth, water, air, and fire. And all of these were sort of mingled together. And so if there was an imbalance, the thought was to bring balance, you had to impact one of these other humans and to bring it back into line. And there was not a lot that you could do in some of these, but you could take blood from people and, uh, and or purge them and have them give up the phlegm and fluid that came from their bowels. Next slide. I think of importance that pharmacists were the first licensed in America in 1808, and that was a landmark in the history of pharmacy. This was by the then governor of the territory, Claiborne. And again, botanists, herbalists, and apothecaries were essential to the life in the, in the colony, and people came to them. And so this particular uh, law that licensed them, it's of interest because it actually uh, told them that they had to uh, They had to be examined and licensed as a pharmacist, and they were prohibited from the sale of deteriorated drugs and restricting the sale of poisons to the public. And that was their main two, uh, two duties. 